Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our Horasis Global Meeting uh, panel discussion on digital vaccines, preparing for the next pandemic. I am the panel moderator, Graham Dodge, president of the PathCheck Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit um, developing open source code for digital precision public health uh, applications. Think of us as sort of the Mozilla Foundation of digital public health applications. I'm here with my fellow panelists, who uh, illustrious panel of experts to talk about this sort of controversial topic, really, of digital vaccines, what that is, what it means to each of them in their professions, um, what examples of what they are, have seen or are developing that fit that description, and what the future for these sorts of digital prophylactics may be. Um, so I'm going to go around and introduce each of them and ask them to both to, to each uh, expand on their backgrounds uh, for a minute or so. I'll start as I go around based on who's next to me here. I'll start with uh, Bhargav Sri Prakash, founder and CEO of Friends Learn and a research partner at Carnegie Mellon University. Bhargav, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Graham. And it's... Uh... It's a real pleasure, honor to be on this panel and be joined by everyone here. Uh, so I uh, am the research translation partner and the founding partner at the, uh, at the Digital Vaccine Project at Carnegie Mellon University. My background is uh, really on the engineering and simulation and data science side of, uh, of the world. Uh, but we've been working for the last uh, more than a decade now. Uh, on the idea of uh, technology or precision, uh, technology-enabled uh, disease prevention. And, uh, and, and so this uh, center at Carnegie Mellon is, is, a, is a multi uh, research, interdisciplinary and a multi-institutional collaboration between uh, researchers at Johns Hopkins, at, uh, at Baylor College of Medicine, at Kansas Medical Center, the University of Michigan, University of Pittsburgh, so there's a, there's a group of, uh, of researchers that have tried to breathe the life into or meaning into, into this whole uh, idea of digital vaccines. So real, real happy to be here and thanks again. Thank you, Bhargav. And next I have Dr. Ramesh Raskar, Associate Professor at MIT Media Lab and Chair of my organization, the PathCheck Foundation. Ramesh, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, thank you, Graham. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. A uh, lot of my research is in thinking about decentralized, crowdsourced epidemiology, um, and COVID nineteen is a is a unfortunately a good example uh, of how this decentralization is critical. When it comes to digital vaccines, uh, you know, a lot of my work is thinking about the privacy technology behind it, computational privacy technology that would actually allow this crowdsourcing and allow the machine learning from this decentralized data. Now, what I would love to kind of come to in the main session uh, is think about, you know, how a lot of the methodologies in, in machine learning and crowdsourcing uh, and behavior uh, change, including new ideas in tokenization and blockchain can play a role uh, in, in digital vaccines. And clearly, digital vaccines and physical vaccines are, you know, different, have different challenges, have some similarities but hopefully we can also talk about some of the fusion of the physical and digital methods of dealing uh, with pandemic. So I'm very excited to talk about this idea that, you know, we can have a ways for this pandemic where just like ways for our traffic journey allows us to crowdsource GPS locations uh, and create real-time maps uh, of the traffic density and then give highly personalized nudges. Uh, and here we have a similar opportunity to create in precision public health by crowdsourcing and providing just in time highly personalized nudges. Excellent. Thank you, Ramesh. And I'm going to go around this way uh, clockwise and introduce Dr. Shanice Hudson, or Nisi, if you are on good terms with her. <laughs> <laughs> She's the chair and science director of Hood Medicine. Nisi, if you may. Uh, Thank introduce you. Yourself. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I did my um, BS in biology at MIT and my uh, PhD <clears throat> was interdisciplinary at the University of Louisville in um, biostatistics and informatics and bioengineering. And I am the chair and founder of Hood Medicine Initiative, which is 
a 501c3 nonprofit that <clears throat> is a collective of scientists, physicians, and hackers and assorted geeks who are dedicated to health e equity and throughout the pandemic to reducing the spread of mis and disinformation in BIPOC communities. Excellent, thank you, Nisi. Next, I have Dr. Jiten Chandra, uh, Chief Medical Officer for CARE Validate. Yeah, Jiten. thank you. Thank you, Graham. And uh, hi, everybody. Nice to be here today. My name is Jiten. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at CARE Validate. Uh, CARE Validate is based in Atlanta, Georgia, and it provides uh, employee health, safety, and wellness software to employers which have 10,000 employees or more. Very nice. Short and sweet. Thank you. <laughs> And um, last but certainly not least, Dr. Melissa Bondi, Chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health at Stanford University. Melissa, Hi. please introduce Thank yourself. Thank you so much, uh, Graham, for inviting me to join this illustrious um, panel. And maybe I'm a little bit of the odd person out, but um, the user and somebody who is really interested in this topic. So as uh, Graham said, I'm the Chair of the Department of Epidemiology, and I'm a cancer epidemiologist, but with a real interest in uh, social disparities and social determinants of health, and my focus has been in precision and population health. Since I've come here to Stanford, I came in October of 2019 to start a new Department of Epidemiology, which was um, a perfect time to come to Stanford where um, there was no Department of Epidemiology, and then the pandemic started and um, coming to Stanford was really important to me because of what kinds of things were going on and the technologies and the things that people were here on this panel are talking about with technology and how do we incorporate these things into research. And that's what's been really important to me is building a department where many of the faculty in our department are ready and we've been building an incredible um, 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 bringing in new faculty who are doing these kinds of this kind of research with as we call digital vaccines but you know really trying to understand how to use smartphones and how to use um, these different types of technology for precision health so that's my goal is to um, do I'm doing some of this as well but also the faculty that we are you know on, people, the faculty that we have are doing much of this kind of work and building dashboards and, you know, personalized um, uh, using smartphones and um, all kinds of different um, uh, models that we've been talking about. So I'm really excited to be here and learning from the people that are on this panel, as well as trying to infuse this in um, our own research as well. Thank you, Melissa. So to just sort of go back and provide an overview of what we are discussing today, um, digital vaccines or digital prophylactics, if you will, um, really kind of fit into this metaphor of this phone being almost like the syringe, if you will, delivering something that is going to help prevent the spread of disease. So with the ubiquity of smartphones and connected devices, the concept of digital vaccines has emerged encompassing evidence-based prevention approaches to behavioral nudging that can stave off the spread of infectious diseases. But the point of this discussion is what do digital vaccines look like? Who is developing them and how will they be regulated? <laughs> because eventually I'm sure they will be, especially if they are effective in doing what the pro they promise to do. So um, I guess let's go through, I'll start, Bhargav, I'll start with you just because also you are, um, you are, doing research right now in developing digital vaccines and using that term, digital vaccine. Um, maybe tell us, you know, your interpretation then of this term and an example use case that you would sort of use as a, you know, exemplary use for this. Sure. Uh, so, so as far as, you know, our uh, interest in work is uh, with, with digital vaccines uh, goes, uh, we, I, I guess as a as a concept, we were imagining way before people, um, you know, had as much of a, of an opinion or an understanding about vaccines. Uh, this was going back to almost 2012, so 10 years ago when we were thinking about the future of disease prevention uh, through all these frontier technologies. Uh, the idea was that um, you know technology itself uh, was going to be more and more. 
uh, ubiquitously available, accessible, uh, and and could play a role in uh, prevention of disease. Our focus uh, with the digital vaccine project and through uh, a lot of the you know trials that we have run have uh, have been based on uh, a, a neuro pathway uh, to being able to induce certain behaviors uh, with a focus on a pediatric population and really be able to uh, use uh, virtual reality as kind of the intervention, if you will, um, and, and immersive technology uh, to be able to shape and induce certain preferences leading to habits. Uh, and, and, and our models through which uh, we were able to do this was really developed based on uh, uh, fMRI work that we had initiated with uh, our collaborators at Kansas Medical Center. And uh, the, the whole idea was that uh, through implicit learning models, uh, we actually were able to message the brain uh, through these repeated exposures and contextually uh, almost induce uh, certain preferences and habits. The preferences and habits that we targeted uh, through our technology were really focused on diet and lifestyle. So what we found was, as we did uh, randomized controlled trials with children, uh, we found that uh, we actually had certain patterns of exposure uh, based on which we would be able to influence or induce healthier food and, and lifestyle preferences uh, and then habits or behaviors and then habits uh, really inducing healthy eating. And that is kind of the central pathway through which we're able to look at, uh, you know, longer term downstream effects at a biomarker level uh, relating to metabolic disease. The pandemic, of course, was something that none of us probably could have anticipated, uh, but it, it kind of was a wake up call to us that, um, you know, the platform that we'd been working on in the context of metabolic disease risk reduction uh, and, and, you know, obesity-related work uh, could apply uh, towards, um, you know, infectious disease risk reduction as well. So for the last couple of years, we've been actually developing a candidate and evaluating it through the same lens of vaccine development. So going from theory to human trials or pilots and then larger scale trials really to establish um, you know all the all the check boxes that vaccines have to establish before they can be deployed at scale, ranging from safety, effectiveness, um, and then generalizability, reproducibility, um, and 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 so on and so forth. So that's kind of how we think of digital vaccines and how it's evolved. Of course, it's a new idea and it's uh, still kind of being shaped. I guess as more researchers and scientists come to it, I think. Uh, the field is definitely poised for a lot of exciting times ahead. So, um, so that's yeah. been that's been our work. Thank you, Bargov. And yeah, it seems like metabolic diseases, chronic diseases that are non-vaccine preventable seem like the obvious beachhead, so to speak, for this concept of digital vaccines. Uh, Dr. Askar, you were telling me earlier that you've actually also attempted to uh, propose some of these digital solutions as digital vaccines, but you've heard some sort of, there's been some backlash to the use of that term. And I'm curious if, it were, if you could comment on that in terms of maybe the acceptance of, of this concept in the greater public health community. Uh, yes, yeah, so when we started, you know, the whole effort in February, March of 2020, uh, you know, it was very exciting for us to use terms like digital vaccines uh, because we thought this is, this is something easy to understand uh, because, you know, usually public health authorities and different the population doesn't understand the, the, the benefit of using smartphone technologies for dealing with uh, public health crisis. And so we thought we could use uh, digital vaccines, but we got to push back from nearly every public health authority we work with, WHO, CDC, folks in White House, you know, state leaders. Uh, and there are multiple concerns. One was it can create a confusion between real vaccines and, and digital vaccines. Uh, issues like hesitancy and so on could be amplified because there's a notion of privacy and uh, lack of agency sometimes uh, in smartphone apps. Uh, and they also thought it could create an illusion 
uh, that, as Melissa said earlier, the social disparity that if technologies are based on digital solutions, then they'll only be deployed for folks who have access to digital technologies. So it was a you know a, a good good lesson to be careful about terminology. And one of the main reasons uh, there was a pushback even within the scientific community was the notion that vaccines are supposed to be once and done um, uh, type of a solution. But digital solutions, as we just heard from Bhargava, are a continuous monitoring, you know, continuous engagement uh, kind of solutions. Uh, so, so there's a mismatch between the two. But today we would argue that vaccines have also become, you know, a, a continuous engagement with boosters and nudges and variants and annual reminders uh, and so on. So I think that the gap between the continuous um, engagement for digital or physical solution seem to be similar now. Well, it sounds like digital vaccines can be used as a behavioral nudging tool to promote actual vaccination. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to hear from Dr. Hudson in terms of, you know, her uh, goals in, in, you know, promoting vaccination in the BIPOC community at the community level, like how these tools and maybe the, the expeditiousness of, in which they can be deployed impacts those, that, that goal from your perspective. Yeah. I think you do have to, like, as you said, take into account <clears throat> the accessibility of the tools. Um, there's obviously an equity there and people who have access to different technologies. Um, but besides that, I think what's important is <clears throat> the cultural tailoring, perhaps. Um, I think for the reasons that Ramesh detailed, there are a lot of issues with hesitancy and, and pushback <clears throat> in the population whether those are rooted in historical distrust or political biases. <clears throat> um, but, and so I think it has to be really clever, right? It can't, um, you know, maybe there's gamification aspects or <clears throat> um, ways to plant seeds that aren't direct, because I think what we've all learned over these past two years is that no one wants to be told what to do no matter how much it's in their best interest. So <laughs> I think it's it's imperative that, for example, you know, there were a lot, when you guys did the Karuna app, I think there were a lot of, um, <laughs> I think there are a lot of good lessons there in looking at, <clears throat> you know, mobility and population density. Like maybe there's ways to kind of cue people to be like, Hey, yesterday you visited a lot of places that were hot spots for, you know, infection or something like that. Being more covert and subliminal about the nudges so that people don't reject them outright, I think is important. Yeah, I know that there was. Uh, oh, Melissa, go ahead. Yeah, so I was going <clears> to <throat> just bring this up because I think there's been some thing, you know, since <clears throat> excuse me, since the pandemic, more people have had access to smartphones, and I think that's changed. But also, like you're saying, I mean, p there's been some of my faculty that have used smartphones to look at opioid use, and you know, being able to see where there's, you know, where we can see things like that. Just not only where the where there's um, you know, people that where there's clusters of cases of different things. I mean, we can identify where there could be potential new clusters where the pandemic might be um, more um, starting out, like even with wastewater and, you know, so many different things that we've been able to learn from the pandemic that um, I think we can put into our own research. And people have, I think, changed their, been able to use um, telemedicine, but, you know, just because smartphones have gotten, you know, people have had to use them, I think, more than ever before. And even with the the war and, you know, in, you know, the Ukraine and so many different things is that we've really been able to, you know, mobilize ourselves to be able to have access. And I think even in communities of, um, you know, that have less access, have access now. Our school, the schools, the kids had to really transition yeah. themselves because of what's happened. Well, yeah, it's it's between remote learning. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. distance learning, remote working. Mm -hmm digital transformation has been pushed about as fast as it can go. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right. The ubiquity of these technologies. And yes, there are still very much um, uh, gaps in, in health equity out there. Um, 
but it seems like there's funding out there to help resolve those gaps. And there are organizations dedicated to doing that. Um, I'd like to t talk to uh, Jaten about um, the employer space, given your expertise in that regard, in terms of how these digital vaccines may change the way employers are thinking about how they you know, have some inter intermediation with employees and how they can impact health outcomes. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, like you said, we operate in the construct of the employer and employee relationships. And in some ways, that's, you know, that's slightly different from sort of the bigger public health uh, picture. You know, one good example there is that a lot of the employers that we work with, and these are like Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, uh, they look at some of these interventions, even if they're like preventative digital health interventions from the lens of compliance to employer policies, which sometimes are inherited from local um, or federal regulations that uh, that these employers are subjected to from organizations like OSHA. Um, and, you know, I think our experience has been that if you are trying to, uh, you know, have something that's preventative, being channeled through this particular employer-employee construct relationship, um, it certainly drives a lot of adoption. Um, however, uh, you know, in our world, when it comes to the ROIs on any digital health intervention, like preventative digital health interventions are certainly the hardest to prove ROI on. And do you think that there would be implications in terms of the regulatory space or in terms of how employers kind of see their roles in either imposing maybe or recommending certain health interventions when it comes to digital vaccines versus mandatory vaccines, right? Any other kind of health intervention that may be required? Yeah, certainly. So, you know, we are, it's our belief in our thesis right now that we're sort of going through this moment where employers are paying more and more attention to the health, wellness, and safety of their most important asset, which is their employees. Uh, and, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly been kind of a tip of the spear to accelerate some of the great work that was already happening in the chronic disease and the health benefits space. So I would agree 100% that by, you know, between digital and physical vaccines or biochemical vaccines, uh, the rate of change in this industry is going to be faster on the digital side. Yeah. And uh, earlier, Bargov was talking about um, the clinical trial process to sort of prove out the reproducibility of the efficacy of these technologies. Melissa, I'm curious to hear your perspective from a sort of clinical epidemiological perspective, what, what the implication of that may be and, and maybe where this metaphor you know, is a bridge too far in certain cases. <laughs> um, trying to think of a good example of that um, in terms of, in, you know, in terms of practice. Um, um, well, I'll give you an example. So Walmart, okay. speaking of large employers, Walmart yeah. did a study where they were able to uh, show that through behavioral nudging, they're able to improve the retention rate, or I should say the, the engagement rate of people who had booked vaccine appointments, um, but may otherwise not actually go through with them. They were through a specific sort of the scientific method of understanding which messages improve the likelihood of them following through with their vaccination. You know, can we then consider SMS text messages as a digital vaccine in this in this sort of metaphor, like from your perspective, which I yeah would, I keep which, you know I yeah it's, we were I was just trying to think of that recently and we were putting you know we've been thinking about this grant that I'm trying to put in on um, persistent poverty and trying to find um, instances say in the VA population where they have access to medical care you know so it's an even population that if they have and they're getting some um, financial um, help through some disability or whatever. And if you can remind people that they should take a certain, you know, that they're at a, um, 
uh, that, that, that they're at uh, a certain time when they should be taking a some certain test or whatever that their um, time for their one of their exams that you can remind them or having um, just like you were talking of reminders for certain things that would they then go and have it you know if they're you know just trying to to remind people when they're you know, certain health conditions that, oh, it's time for your cholesterol testing, or it's time for if they're a smoker and they have COPD, it's time to take a spiral CT or something like that, trying to remind them to do things. Is that going too far? I don't know. We're trying to think of how do you level the playing field to help them to do not help them because that's not a good way of saying things but to remind them to do things that might reduce their risk of lung cancer if you can identify something uh, a lesion early when you know they're at high risk when you can you know if they have economic um, um, health they're getting benefits additional benefits they have medical care or is there ways to help incentivize them through these kinds of, um, of, uh, of apps, you know, so we're trying to think of ways like that, if there are ways to incentivize and does that impact in a positive way or not? I don't know. And actually, Dr. Hudson, she posed this, a similar question to Jaten about incentivization on the employer side. Um, Jaten, do you want to comment on that? As Are there ways I... to incentivize on the employer side? Yeah, I was just shuffling for my mute button. Sorry. Yeah, you know, um, um, again, I think so. Just a real quick background. So I'm a physician and an engineer by training, and I spent some time at Georgia Tech doing research. So, and now, you know, I'm 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 part of this uh, this company that I started. So, you know, again, there's tons and tons of research on incentivization in health for like you know decades and decades. I think what we're seeing in the field these days specifically as it relates to what the employers had to do with incentivizing their workforce to get vaccinated uh, for COVID-19, first dose, second dose booster, across our client base, uh, you know, we saw cash incentives and other types of incentives, the cash in incentives ranging from like $50 to $500. And, you know, just again, subjectively, I don't have the data in front of me, neither of those interventions uh, up the vaccination rate by more than 10%. Uh, so that's, you know, that's sort of top of mind in terms of where we are today. But again, this is by no means a benchmark against all the wonderful incentive work that's been done prior. So um, I'm also thinking through um, how digital vaccines may play a role in, in, in reducing almost the the reproductive score of certain diseases by encouraging things like social distancing at certain times. And, you know, um, and I think that plays into the analogy that Ramesh uh, opened with about the Waze app for health and how a tool like that can actually affect health outcomes by giving you that timely information about when and where people are getting sick and therefore what you can kind of do to, re to, um, to uh, reduce your risk of that. And in that sense, are, is that is that a digital vaccine as well? And I, I guess I'll just sort of open it up now to anybody who has thoughts on this. We have about ten more minutes left. Yeah, Ramesh, go ahead. Um, I mean, if you if you you know if you think about the dream scenario of what uh, you know a physical vaccine rollout would look like, as you know, it it took less than forty eight hours for for Moderna to actually have the vaccine ready after they had the genetic sequence. So the the vaccine science actually is pretty well understood now. What's really difficult is how to get it out uh, to people and how do, how do we make sure that the vaccination process rolls out. So if you think about a dream scenario, it would be you, know, you can instantly create a cohort and recruit volunteers. You can perform decentralized clinical trials. You can possibly work on three or four arms in parallel as opposed to just one, just one vaccine candidate. Uh, you can monitor in real time if the candidates, the cohort that you have recruited, are getting exposed uh, to this to this um, virus through exposure notification, uh, and what medicine they're taking that's either reducing or increasing the chance of uh, getting infected. Uh, and then after that, after the vaccine has been delivered, you know what kind of population is it getting delivered to, from GPS coordinates to to demographics. And after that, instead of using systems like VARES and VSAFE that only focus on hospitalizations as as ad adverse effects if people can also start entering kind of you know mild 
uh, to medium uh, stake uh, side effects. Uh, and finally, kind of long term, you know, long term monitoring. So things like long COVID and so are very well understood. While doing all of this, there are nudges to make sure you get vaccinated and you stay safe and you still mask. That's kind of the dream scenario, right? And if you think about apps like Uber or Amazon, they actually achieve most of this life cycle to us and to Shanice's point without telling us in a you know kind of in your face. Apps like Uber and Amazon are able to do that for us. So with just a few million dollars of investment, we could actually create, you know, an ongoing system, uh, you know, that allows us to roll out vaccines in a very short amount of time. Uh, and instead of demonizing people who have vaccine hesitancy, uh, we can actually understand what are the hesitations and what we can do to solve the problems. I mean, men, remember those days when many of us were hesitant to get into a stranger's taxi, which we now call Uber? You know, <laughs> all those hesitances can be overcome if you understand, you know, what the consumer behavior in this case, you know, the, the citizen behavior is. So we have a true opportunity to actually kind of dramatically change. I mean, if we are hit with a pandemic in the future, it's still going to take us 90 days to even six months before we can actually develop the vaccine and get it out there. But with these combined solutions, physical and digital, we could have things under control in less than 100 days. And it would seem that, yeah. oh, go ahead, Bhargav. No, please. Well, I was just going to um, also mention medical adherence in general. Um, so you, vaccine hesitancy is sort of one category of, of issues in medical adherence. Um, so you know, if you have that behavioral nudging capability to encourage people to stick to medications that would help improve their health outcomes, uh, that aren't having adverse reactions that are, you know, things that are helping them handle a chronic situation or a metabolic disease, for example, that would be another use case here, um, it would seem, in terms of preventing further disease burden in a population. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, the, the, the important, I think, uh, trend and paradigm um, that's been this arc uh, over the last many years is this intersection of uh, technology and medicine uh, and consumer technology and, you know, health outcomes. And that's always been kind of our inspiration. Uh, but uh, I think where, uh, you know, most consumer technology uh, doesn't really um, uh, kind of meet the, the, the very high bar that a vaccine would uh, typically meet in terms of you know, human trials and ethical approvals and scientific, you know, committees that are reviewing the protocols and understanding the risks and deliberating on whether this intervention should even get to, you know, being uh, rolled out across populations or not. Uh, but all those considerations uh, could be accelerated uh, if, you know, based on an understanding of the technology platform and based on kind of a layering of evidence so that we understand the risks, both short-term and long-term. Uh, but the whole paradigm that we've been attempting to create through digital vaccines is, is really uh, very much in line with uh, you know, evidence-based medicine. And as digital medicine and digital therapeutics uh, have really emerged as kind of prescription-grade uh, you know, therapeutics that are all software-based, uh, we were always thinking of this one sliver of medicine which focused on prevention and did so rigorously and did so uh, in, in, a, in a deeply evidence-based way. Um, so, so, so that was kind of the, the way we uh, kind of framed the thinking around uh, the concept. The other thing that we did uh, was uh, kind of this uh, understanding that uh, even the technology platform uh, – could uh, could result as in terms of outcomes, uh, either be induced. So behavior is one outcome, uh, but uh, induced behavior, uh, you know, based on a physiological uh, inducement uh, leading to behavior, actually had uh, a mechanistic basis. So you actually understood uh, the mechanisms based on which certain outcomes could be derived. And so those were kind of the frameworks or the lens through which we would uh, be able to even get approvals to be able to run trials on 
you know, children or uh, children considering that they would be a vulnerable population, informed consent, and, and, and this entire process through which medicine has evolved and, and created vaccines in the past. But the same lens applied to technology so that it could be prescription grade and, and uh, you know, evidence-based um, with, with the risks quantified uh, so, that, so that there would be kind of a true uh, benefit of the scalability of technology, the speed of technology, but the rigor of evidence-based medicine. So that's, uh, that's kind of one of the things we've been deeply thinking about and the ethics uh, associated yeah. with it. And with the last few minutes, actually, um, you touched on a few things that I think are highly relevant to how we think about digital vaccines from a standards, best practices, maybe even regulatory perspective. We've talked yes. about the need for clinical trials for reproducibility of the results. We've talked about um, equitable, equitable solutions so that there's health equity in these solutions for these certain communities that might not have access to certain technologies. And we mm -hmm. talked about privacy preserving technology. Is there anything else? And, and we talked about ethics as well at this point. Are there any other aspects to what the standards should be moving forward in producing these, what are essentially technologies to intervene in a sort of a precise public health way to improve health outcomes. What are we missing, if anything, uh, from those from that list I just I just enumerated? I guess off the top of my head, I would say risk of effectiveness and efficacy, right? Because if Uber has an issue where your uh, you know your your cab driver cancels on a ride, and the cost of something like that may not be that significant, but if a, a digital intervention that was designed to prevent COVID or, you know, any infectious disease or any disease, the risks have to be understood. Not to say that any vaccine um, be 100% effective, but at least it had to be quantified in terms of the absolute and the relative risk. So, you know, at least those kind of considerations have to be well understood before it becomes uh, ready to be rolled out from a public health or a global health perspective, right? So, so the risk, the risk, the benefit, the cost, all those considerations uh, uh, would 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 certainly factor in. Besides the ethics, so that's the the premise of evidence based medicine. Jiten, you've been down the FDA approval process, as I understand. Any other thoughts on that in that regard? Um, so before I answer the FDA, you know, uh, question, I, I do think that one thing that we've seen the most amount of success with in terms of adoption is kind of trying to design so we meet people where they are, uh, and that could be geographically, like you know, their language, the, the nuance of like their their communication style, and also where they are sort of in the process of behavior change. Different people respond to different types of uh, interventions at different stages of their life. So just kind of being mindful of all of that, I think, has been best practice that we've tried to put into our design thinking. Uh, you know, from an FDA perspective, um, you know, I think definitely what was said before about efficacy, outcomes, uh, risk, benefit analysis. I think the, uh, you know, I think the industry is mature enough that the same standards would be applied to anything that claims to have a health outcome, digital or, or otherwise. Excellent. Thank you. And we have about a minute or so left. Um, let's just wrap up with what we each think is sort of the future role of these digital vaccines and digital pro prophylactics. Um, Dr. Bondi, I'll start with you if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think there's a big role for it. And I think we've learned so much from this pandemic that hopefully that we can keep building from it. But, you know, the community buy-in, and I think that the, that we've learned a lot from <clears throat> from from just getting people, you know, there was so much hesitancy. And I think that um, trying to, even from the beginning for the next pandemic, we just said in 90 days, we can get this done and we can get that done. But, you know, even from the start, if we could make sure that there's some community involvement and in some ways of, you know, just making sure that we have some community involvement from the beginning in special populations that weren't involved in some of these things would be important as well. Ramesh, any final thoughts on the future of these technologies? I, I think Melissa said it well. If you have to tame the future pandemics in, in less than 90 days, then we need a, a fusion of physical vaccines and digital vaccines. 
And for both of this, we need to be prepared. We need to deploy them now in low stakes scenarios, whether it's flu or some other ongoing uh, epidemics, so that we are ready for future shocks. Yeah, so that we're addressing the baseline of disease burden, not just the the pandemic. <laughs> uh, Nisi, uh, your thoughts? I think one thing we haven't touched on too much is maybe a way to engage the business sector. Maybe that's something that's incentivization in that realm, but I think it's important um, to have buy-in in terms of what we're trying to nudge people to do because as we've seen if businesses aren't inclined to close or put their own mask mandates in or put their own social distancing in place then that sends a message to the consumer that it's not important right so i think there has to be some engagement there you know to everyone's point to rush's point about the ways app sort of correlation you know if we're looking at you know trying to provide people information on where there are safe places or where places are you know there's clusters of infection, then we we need to incentivize that in some ways where businesses will want to be on the green list, you know, and like just have that effect where everyone in their particular place in society is contributing to everyone's overall safety. So, so I'll bounce that over then to Jaten in terms of, you know, that bottom line business perspective. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and I'll add to that just the fact that, you know, before COVID, influenza caused about $16 billion in losses and lost productivity in the U.S. alone uh, due to flu season. Um, so, yeah, from that business employer perspective, Jaten, any final thoughts? Yeah, 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 certainly. I mean, I think, you know, from an economic standpoint, uh, most of employer tools are sold on a per employee per month basis. And the reason I bring that up is because it automatically sort of limits the ability of small employers or mid-sized employers to uh, generate enough ROI, you know, from tools that kind of some of the tools that kind of we're discussing and hypothesizing about. So I guess my takeaway from that is, uh, you know, I think certainly Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, you know, play a big role in setting the culture as much as, you know, all the other factors in our society. So I think a little bit of responsibility does fall on them uh, to to help us with uh, getting these tools out. Well said. And Bargov, you get the last word. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, it's I think, a, a, a very exciting, exciting time. And uh, this pandemic, uh, while I think it's pushed the limits uh, in terms of everything we took for granted in terms of normal, uh, it's also uh, created uh, innovation like we've never seen before. And I think there's been a quantum shift in terms of a mindset as well as the fact that, you know, mRNA editing as a platform uh, itself was, was, was not perhaps ready to be accepted in, in, in the way that, uh, that it has, uh, has been and, and the role that it has played. Now, I think uh, as we think out into the future, uh, we should be preparing for vaccine platforms uh, that have the ability uh, to kind of, uh, you know, have have kind of a, a layered uh, intelligence and understanding science and evidence so that uh, if and when we need to really kind of ramp up rapidly, uh, there is, the, there is the, the, the underlying science is understood, the underlying deployment, the modulization of the technology, in our case, the, the neural network, uh, can rapidly be trained and uh, and 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 repurposed. So uh, so I think if at all we had to learn from what happened and think about the future, um, uh, you know, the pandemic has also reminded us that prevention is 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 worth a lot. And uh, and and I guess we we've, we've all borne the brunt of you know trying to prevent the pandemic and 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 gone through. Uh, uh, a massive shift in, in the way we operate. and uh, But the real pandemic still exists, whether the metabolic disease pandemic or the underlying kind of risk factors um, that, that, are, that are kind of the, beneath the, the tip of the iceberg. So, so there's a massive opportunity for you know, new ways of uh, precision disease prevention 
through technology, which is what uh, we dream about at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Very well said. Thank you very much. And, you know, it also does not yet. We still have the issue of health inequities, obviously, that we can hope that these tools can help us overcome. Uh, Thank you to all of you for joining us in this panel discussion. Um, Thank you to Horasis Global Meeting for inviting PathCheck Foundation to have this discussion with all of you. Um, I will just wrap up by saying again, thank you. uh, Bhargav Sri Prakash from... uh, uh, Friends Learn and Carnegie Mellon, Dr. Melissa Bondi from Stanford University, uh, Dr. Ramesh Raskar from MIT and also PathCheck Foundation, Dr. Shanice Hudson from uh, Hood Medicine, and Jiten Chabra from Care Validate. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It was a real honor. Thank you.